Well, welcome, True Hope. People joining us online, people here. It is good to be together. We've had a great time of singing songs. People have dissolved in tears. It's awesome. This is worship. We have shared. Um, if you want that stuff, come and join us. But um, we're now heading into our message. And so, welcome. Today's title of the message is Freedom, Not Religion. Well, I meant to change that. Freedom, not religion. <laughs> I see that. <laughs> okay, well, I'm a technical wizard. Freedom, not religion. Um, we are joining Jesus in a next section. We've been through the Beatitudes, and uh, Jesus comes on the scene, right? There's people following him. This is probably a... Uh, uh, um, kind of a collection of different things he taught at different times but simultaneously it's what he taught on the mountain it must have happened over several days probably because if you look at there were a certain amount of people and then more people came so you know that can't have been an hour message although who knows right but it was uh, a longer time but he's talking about the beatitude so thank you piper um and he started to, to say, hey, this is what we used to, to be all about. And now um, he didn't revoke the Old Testament. He helped them envision it in a new way. So he said, right, blessed are those, so happy are those. If you understand you have nothing to bring, poor in spirit. If you're mourning for your sin, that is awesome because you get comforted. Blessed are the meek, those who, who aren't insisting on their own rights and, and strutting their stuff, but rather surrender all the, their capacity to the control of Jesus, for theirs is the, uh, they will inherit the earth. Blessed are you when you're hunger and thirsting for righteousness. There's the promise to be filled. And I've said before, and I will say again, this is an awesome prayer to pray every day. Lord, help me to hunger and thirst for righteousness, hunger and thirst for your word, hunger and thirst for you, Jesus. He will answer that prayer, says so, right? Then blessed are the merciful because they will be shown mercy. And so oftentimes, you know, we've talked about maybe different types of Christians. We want mercy, but we are harsh, you know, can be as Christians and seen as judgmental and harsh. And Jesus says, blessed are the merciful. They get the mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. You want more of God? you got to be wholly devoted to Him. Not pure in heart as in you're never going to do anything wrong. That doesn't exist. But pure in heart that you're not, I'm devoted to this and Jesus. You know, that you want to see God, it's got to be all in. And blessed are the peacemakers, the ones who bring the peace, for they will be called sons of God. And blessed, you know, the best blessing of all, blessed are you when you're persecuted for righteousness sake. It doesn't feel good, but that is truly being like Jesus. And so that is the backdrop. And then he says, when you are that way, when you're that way, he doesn't say that exactly, but that is the implication go and be salt and light right don't be sold your own way or light your own way but be that person and then wherever you go you end up being appropriate salt and appropriate light and people can't help but be drawn to jesus so that's the backdrop so now he starts in Matthew 5, 17 through the rest, all the way through Matthew 7. Uh, we're looking at Matthew 17 through 20 today. So uh, from this point through chapter 7, Jesus is actually starting a long discussion of the law. And, and he is explaining what's what. Because the, he came to a system where it was all about you have to behave a certain way. You have to follow the rules to be approved by God. And, and it seemed like that was what God's laws were all about. But they hadn't heard from God directly for 400 years. And the Pharisees had made it so many more rules. So there's like 516 in the Old Testament. They added all these layers of, you know, you could only walk so many step, steps on the Sabbath, this you could do, this you couldn't do, and so it'd be, it just became ridiculous. And so Jesus starts a long discussion of the law and really what he intended. So he wants us to know that it's freedom 
to follow God and to love God and to worship God, not religion. Now, what's the difference between following Jesus and religion? How would we describe a religion? Uh, rules. Rules? Rigid. It, rigid. It, it's not like a system of behavior to try to please God, to earn favor, right? It is a ritual we go through in so many ways. And part of it is comfortable to us. Why do you think that might be? Structure. Structure and it feels what? The very thing we started with today, that there is no control. <laughs> it feels like we have control. I know what to do. I know when we sit. I know when we stand. I know what we say. I know how we pray. I know when to come. I want, you know. And honestly, the last song we sing is Come Holy Spirit, Fall on Us, Burn Like a Fire, you know. <laughs> Set us ablaze, basically. God is just really unruly. He just does what he does, and he goes where he goes, and things are never predictable. And so, as a, as humans, we kind of want to, uh, we say, Jesus takes the wheel, but until you don't go where I want to go, then I'm, I'm going to hop back in the seat and take over, because it's really uncomfortable for us, right? So we like religion, kind of, but with it comes all these chains and all this, what God doesn't want. There's no love. It can become cold and rigid and no love. Um, and so following Jesus is about a relationship with a living God. That still does means we obey what he wants, but it's not like we have to fear. If I stand at the wrong time or whatever, I don't, I don't need, you know, whatever, right? If I miss a cue, whatever. So it's freedom to become all God has for us. And Jesus re-explaining the law really is, hey, freedom to become all that God has for us to be according to who he made us to be. I don't have to be you, and praise God, you don't have to be me, right? So, but we do need to live within the rules. Like salt and light, the way Jesus intends, is still living according to the law, but not controlled by the law. So, we read Matthew 5, 17 through 20, and Piper, I think, yeah. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Just hang on there one second. So God gave the law and the prophets for good reason, right? It just really means the Old Testament. And it's uh, God's prerogative. I have to remember my notes from a while back. Hang on. Bear with me. Okay. I don't Where's the Leviticus pieces? Oh, here we go. Um, God's prerogative to establish the law. In fact, in Leviticus 18, he says, 18, 1 through 5, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. And then I skipped 3 because it was not pertinent to this particular part. You shall observe my judgments and keep my ordinances to walk in them. And then it's a colon. I am the Lord your God. Why do you do that? Because God gave him and he is God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. You get why? You get who? I am the Lord. I gave you this. Why should you keep them? Because I'm the Lord. And you'll be blessed. Why? Because I'm the Lord. So, any confusion? No. Le Leviticus 19.37 says this, Therefore you shall observe all my statutes and all my judgments and perform them. Perform them. I am the Lord. Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to destroy the law and the prophets. Because where do they come from? They come from the Lord, right? God, the Father. But to fulfill them, to embody them, he is demonstrating what it actually means to live it out. And guess what? Jesus is God. So um, it is not too difficult for him to do that. Spurgeon, a famous uh, preacher from England, centuries ago, said, Jesus came to free the law from what it had been made. He fulfills the law. He embodied all its commands in his own life. 
That's what Spurgeon said. So Jesus embodied the law and lived perfectly conformed to the law of God. But he wasn't religious. Because who did he upset the most ultimately? <laughs> the religious people. Because he wasn't doing, hey God, you're not doing it right. That's awesome. So, um, so then we go to the next part, the next verse. And Jesus says, For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by, by no means pass away from the law until it's all fulfilled. And so he says, For assuredly, it actually is the word amen. Amen. I say to you, it is uh, verily, verily, sometimes translated, right? This is the first occurrence of it in the book of Matthew. And so it's kind of, pay attention, I'm about to say something big. And it uh, copies the Old Testament, thus says the Lord, except he is the Lord. So he's not going to say, thus says the Lord, because it's weird to speak in third person about yourself. Um, he is the word of God. He is God. And he says, amen, like, you know, assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot, and that was the smallest Hebrew letter, or one tittle, which is the smallest stroke in the Hebrew language. So the minutest part of the law that God gave will by no means pass away until all is fulfilled. Now, who is the fulfiller of this law? Jesus, Jesus is. So we go, uh, um, wait, it says go to notes. Hang on, go to notes. I'm going to my notes. So the law will stand until God accomplishes his perfect will and plan, right? So we go on. Whoever, therefore, breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches people so, men so, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So whoever therefore breaks, it isn't breaking as in, uh, I'm not supposed to lie, but I lied. Or I'm not supposed to, hopefully we don't need to have that example with murder. I'm hoping pretty close we're not doing that. But it actually means whoever dissolves, annuls, makes uh, 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 invalid. So, do you remember at some point the Pharisees, uh, Jesus confronts the Pharisees and says, you say, you know, the law says that uh, a man needs to honor his father and his mother. But you say, whatever I was going to d use to take care of you is Corbin. So money dedicated to the Lord. So therefore I don't no longer need to take care of you. And so they were making up a way so that they could wiggle around the law for their own purposes. And so this, they were annulling it, dissolving it, making it invalid. And that is not, not what Jesus is saying. The other thing is, like, there were people there who could, you know, who were like, who loved God, who wanted to keep the law. And Jesus is saying, don't worry, I didn't come to abolish it. There were people who wanted to overthrow the government. That's always ex existed, right? Um, and Jesus is like, sorry, not coming to lead a rebellion. And then there were people who were super afraid that he would change their rules. And he's saying, we're going to go back to the original design, right? He addressed everyone in their own way. So whoever, therefore, makes the law invalid, one of the least of the commandments, and teaches others to do so, he's directly addressing the Pharisees and their teaching, the whole system, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. It's the kingdom on earth, heaven come not not the kingdom in heaven he's talking about he has come kingdom of heaven exists on earth and they might think they're all that but they're like on the bottom if they follow jesus when they're saying that but whoever does and teaches them the verse continues he shall be called great honored he shall be honored he or she in the kingdom of heaven so um if there's anything else I wanted to share about that. This is a problem when you've done it a while back. Okay. Um, Galatians, uh, in Galatians, Paul says, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness came, comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. 221. 
So Jesus is very clear, like the law is the law, and it's meant for good, and it's meant to lead people to God, and it's meant for all that, and Paul agrees. But he tried, right? He tried more than most, probably, to do it all perfectly. And it led him to nowhere, to a confrontation with Jesus who says, why are you persecuting me? If you could get righteous from the law, one, I would have done it. Two, Christ died for nothing. It's pretty big. So we don't want to dishonor the law, but we also don't want to make the law God. We just want to follow the Lord to the best of our ability, right? Because it's freedom, not religion. Freedom to love Jesus. Freedom to follow Jesus. Freedom to be who we are made to be. And then Matthew 5.20 says this, For I say to you, that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, because were they truly righteous or just outwardly looking like it, right? You will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So he's not talking about individual Pharisees, because we know that Nicodemus and uh, Joseph of Arimathea were people who believed. So it's not every Pharisee, but he's saying the, the system or as a group, unless your righteousness is different, exceeds um, what, what they're doing, you won't, you won't find Jesus. You won't find the kingdom. Paul in Philippians 3, 6 through 9 writes this, concerning, about himself, concerning zeal for the law, I was persecuting the church. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I've counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. And that is our, the charge to us too, right? That's Jesus' invitation. We make it about other stuff. And other people make it about other stuff, but being in Jesus' presence, and it's so easy to get distracted. Oh my goodness. A thousand piece puzzles are great for them. Um, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. So we need to live according to the law as Christ followers, but we don't... Uh, and we need to live it and teach it, but not teach it in a uh, religious, uh, strict sense, rigid sense, but more in how we, you know, you teach it by how you live it. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Kind of like how kids learn. Hey, that's brilliant. Uh, then we shall be great, great because we are righteous because of Christ's work in us. Right? Breast, uh, the breastplate of righteousness. We are made righteous. You're already holy. Maybe you should turn to each other and say, you are holy. <laughs> you are holy. <laughs> Hebrews 10 tells us that. We are holy because we accepted Jesus. Positionally, we are holy. Now, and then there's reality. We've got a long way to go before we actually look like we are. And so Hebrews 10 says... We are holy, and we're being made holy. So the day-to-day -day operation of letting the Holy Spirit take the junk and transform it into life is the process of being made holy. But positionally, we're already righteous. We're already holy. When God sees you, He sees Jesus. When God sees you, you're already holy. You're already righteous. We don't have to beg God. We just have to show up to Dad. <laughs> Because Jesus said we made it possible and we're supposed to boldly approach the throne of grace, right? We can just run into the throne room. We don't have to worry like Esther that, uh oh, if you don't extend the scepter off with the head or, you know, on the or whatever. But we get to just run in and go, oh, <laughs> Dad, help. Life's too hard, right? That's, that's who we have. And we have our brother, Jesus, who's also our Lord and Savior and very complicated multi-layer relationship <laughs> he's at the right hand praying for us now with the Holy Spirit living in us and when we can't even have words he's groaning for us 
um, it's Jesus' work on the cross that makes us righteous. And we follow Jesus' example living in submission to God's law. We're not going to be those kind, kinds of Christians that just pretend we can go and sin some more. Jesus does not say to people, go and sin some more. What is the actual quote? Go and sin no more. <laughs> right. Go and sin no more. I just want to make sure we're all right on that. <laughs> but isn't that what a lot of people do? Now I can go and sin some more? No. Go and sin no more. Because we have to work out our salvation in fear and tremble, trembling, practical righteousness. And it's a long, long journey. Right? So. So what about us? Here's the thing. The law leads us to Jesus because we can't do it. To be saved. And then guess what? Jesus points us right back to the law as to, to learn about the heart and character of God and to learn how to live, what our conduct looks like and how to be sanct sanctified. That be is becoming holy. Sanctification It's a big word. So, um, yeah, so Leviticus 19.2 says, Speak to the entire assembly of Israel and say to them, Be holy because I am holy, says God. Because I, the Lord your God, am holy. You be holy because I, the Lord, am holy. And what does holy mean? We think it's kind of a halo we thing. Or it means separated. It means set apart. Blessed are the pure of heart, right? The ones who are separated to God. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Be separated. Be apart from, from all that other stuff, says God, because I am that. And Jesus fulfills. So here it says Jesus came to fulfill the law. So here's... Some notes that I read. He fulfilled the doctrinal teachings. He did all the law commanded. He fulfills prophecy. He fulfilled the moral and legal demands. And he fulfilled the penalty of the law by dying on the cross for us. Our Jesus is an amazing, amazing Lord and Savior. And we love him very much. And I hope that this inspires us to love him more and to grow in our knowledge and relationship with him. There we go. All right. I will pray. We'll say goodbye to our friends online. <laughs> Lord Jesus, thank you that you've set us free, that you died on the cross, that we have the opportunity to have life and freedom. We thank you for it. And I pray, Lord, that we would live in that freedom, not religious, but free that we come to you with our burdens and that we share with each other, that we would live as community of believers bearing one another's burdens and, and also seeking your presence. Lord, would you help us to hunger and thirst for righteousness, to hunger and thirst for your word and to hunger and thirst for you, Jesus? Would you fill us? Would you draw us? Would you grow us? Would you make us the people you designed us to be? And would you set us free to, and you've already come to set us free. Will you help us to live as set free people so that others may too find how good you are and how amazing being saved by you is. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Take a bye.